Welcome back, everyone. Uh, please do like and subscribe. Hopefully, my voice isn't too croaky as hay fever season has started. So let's get into question number two for the long answer questions. GF Training provides training courses for industry in various locations around the country. The company has a head office in the Midlands. The company has a local area network in the head office. The network is used to carry out day-to-day -day administration tasks, store personal information about delegates and trainers, store details of courses, produce and store up-to-date training materials, communicate internally and externally. GF Training has a pool of shared laptops. All this means is that they have laptops that people can pick from. So let's say when you go to college or go to school, the laptops are in a laptop trolley and you simply go pick one. That's a pool of laptops. So GF Training has a pool of shared laptops that trainers use to access up-to-date training materials and information about delegates. Trainers often deliver courses on consecutive days in different locations. They use a VPN, a virtual private network, to access the LAN, a local area network. What this means is that on consecutive days, they go out day to day and they have courses in different locations. So today they might be in London, Nick, um, Tuesday they might be in Kent, on Wednesday they might be in Essex. That's what it means. For part number one, it says discuss the implications to the trainer of accessing training materials and delegate information using a VPN. So again, a discuss question is going to need back and forth, positive and negative, because it says discuss and it says implications. Implications is so the end result of whatever you're doing is going to be the implications. What are the implications of you doing this thing? So if I use a VPN, if I use shared laptops, what are the good and bad things about me doing that? So discuss it. So first we have the benefits of using a VPN. The VPN will give trainers secure access to resources on the LAN when they are not in the head office. So how this typically works, when I'm at home using my work laptop, for me to actually access stuff on the shared area on my school's network, I have to use a VPN. And what that does is it does something called um, network tunneling or VPN tunneling, where it essentially tricks my laptop into thinking I'm actually at school plugged into the school's network so I can access those resources. Otherwise, I would not be able to access them. The same thing happens here. The VPN is installed on these training laptops to trick the laptop into thinking it's in the office. So because it thinks it's in the office, these resources are typically where they would be on a server or a hard drive somewhere. And the trainee or the person can access those files relatively easily. The next for benefits of using a VPN, we'll need to have laptops set up so that a VPN client can be launched this will enable the server and laptop to verify each other as authentic and subsequently all internet communication will be encrypted and secure for from eavesdropping. Again, most VPNs, most good VPNs, all VPNs actually should have some form of encryption enabled. And again, what is encryption? So go back and read what encryption is. That is a question that might come up. So it's the process of making the information or the data that is present or being sent and received unreadable to a third party. So let's say you have a twin and you two sit down because you two know each other so well, you create your own mini language. So when you're in front of your parents or guardians speaking, they actually don't know what you're saying. They know that you're speaking to each other. They can hear it. They can see your lips moving. They don't know what's being said. It's similar to encryption. So you're sending a message on WhatsApp to a new person and it typically says end-to-end -end encryption enabled what that means if someone manages to hack whatever they need to hack to get access to your messages because it's encrypted and only your device and the person's device you're sending um, the messages to has the key to unlock it even if i get hold of your messages i won't know what's going on because it's encrypted it's jumbled it's scrambled so i won't be able to read the original message the next one, trainers will use a login and password to access a VPN. So this is typically a username or email address to access the VPN. Now, this makes it more secure because the user has to, again, authenticate themselves. They, they won't just be able to turn the laptop on, click on the VPN software and jump straight in. They have to authenticate themselves every single time they put a new or turn a new laptop on. They have to log in for it to work. Now, this is really good because if someone gets hold of that laptop, and they simply manage to log into the laptop itself. So when you open Windows or open your laptop, you get to log in with a username and password. If someone is able to do that, the fact that the VPN needs to have a login or a username and password means that they still won't have access to 
any of the information on the server they can only use the stuff directly installed on that laptop i do want you guys to keep in mind these are not just benefits for this company of using a vpn these are typical vpn benefits however we have to link these answers that we're giving back to the question that they asked. So they're asking about the pool of laptops. They're asking about the resources. So the next one we have, the VPN gives secure access even when delegates are using unsecured public networks. As I've mentioned before in previous sections, if you ever go to McDonald's or KFC, any one of these restaurants, Costa, and you have free Wi-Fi, do not ever, ever, ever use that Wi-Fi unless you have a VPN installed and activated on your phones. The one I use on Android is called Secure VPN, completely free. If you do not have a VPN, do not use those networks. They are mostly unsecured. They're secured in the fact that um, sometimes you might need a password, so you might use your KFC login details. They're semi-secured, but everyone has might have a KFC password. Everyone might have a McDonald's password, right? And these networks probably aren't being checked for security updates properly because they, it's, it's just free Wi-Fi. So, well, free internet. So please, I'm begging you not to use that. And um, even when the person, the trainee, is using an unsecured network, their information is still fine because not only does it do VPN tunneling, not only does it do IP masking, it also does the encryption as well. So those three things coupled together gives you much better security. So let me quickly recap. VPN tunneling, I, I would say, is um, making your device seem as if it's somewhere else. So typically, you guys use it for like Netflix. So when you VPN tunnel to, let's say, you're in America and you want to watch the American TV show and you're in the UK, you, you can watch that perfectly fine. Uh, encryption, as I mentioned earlier, is jumbling or scrambling the stuff so not so a third party won't be able to decrypt or understand what is being said what was the last one again uh encryption vpn tunneling ip masking typically this does ip masking as well where it, it kind of hides your ip address or makes it look as if you're somewhere else so that's normally coupled with vpn tunneling the next one says the delegates information must be kept secure to comply with the dpa using the vpn will ensure security I will will help ensure security that's like, again vpns are very good at typically for helping with security though they might be slow in some cases if security is your main thing you might want to use a vpn even when using your banking app on your mobile phone your your um your wi-fi your data just use a vpn there's no downside to having stuff more secure if speed is not an essential part of what you need to do hotels frequently have unsecured networks Trainers will be in hotels, etc. overnight if they're delivering meetings on consecutive days or if they have to travel long distances from home. So again, we're looking at the question, we're looking at the context of the question because they'll be doing consecutive meetings in different cities every day. As I mentioned, you might be in London, Birmingham, Manchester in one day. Because of that, they most likely won't be staying at home. They'll most likely be staying in a hotel, a motel, an like Airbnb. So those Wi-Fi connections are not known to them. It's not secure, let's say. So having a VPN, again, adds more security. So it's, it, it, it mainly comes down to security for a company like this. For someone who is at home, maybe security isn't the main thing for them unless they're doing um, heavy security stuff like banking. If they're just trying to get speed or trying to do stuff on the internet, maybe speed is going to be something that is important to them. This last one is also about security. Trainers may be home-based and may have to travel to venues, train trains coffee shops etc service area stations may provide unsecure wi-fi so having a vpn means that even though you're on some really not so safe wi-fi connection to get the internet access having a vpn gives you that security that extra level of security for the other reasons i mentioned earlier the second part of this question needed us to speak about the types of materials that will be accessed as well i will copy and paste the actual question in the description so you guys can read it to yourself to see how you would answer it so the first one says the delegates attending courses may change at short notice trainers will need to have access to up-to-date lists and details and, and detail information similarly they will need to provide head office with information about attendance yeah very true and uh, to be honest the vpn doesn't help with this in any way other than having that secure connection again it comes back to security so all of this stuff in that first point there can be accessed or done via typical unsecured internet 4g 5g whatever the case is but it's again down to the security because the list of people 
you'll probably have details, name, addresses, bank details, all of that stuff on the database or, or, or on the server somewhere. So you want to be able to access that in the most secure way possible when not in the office, when not in the school, when not in wherever they are. Trainers will need access to the latest versions of training materials. Therefore, they must have access to the LAN, to the local area network at all times when they are not in the head office. So the head office has the LAN, the, the local area network, when that's where everything is going to be stored. You're not in the office. How do you get access to it? Now, things can be set up where you can just log in across the internet and access files. However, that makes it much more susceptible to someone hacking in. So having a VPN trick your laptop into thinking that you're in the LAN is a much, much, much safer way than simply giving someone a simple username and password to access anything they want over the internet. So again, the LAN is in the head office, the main company in London, for example, I am in Birmingham or Manchester and I need to get to those new resources, the latest versions of the training materials. The best way for me to do that is to use a VPN. Now, you might think, yeah, but they could just use OneDrive or Google Drive. That could work as well. That could work as well. But because we're assuming it, it's on the land, the local area network is going to have maybe a hard drive attached to it or a server attached to it. That's where the information is. They mention nothing about cloud, so we can't make any assumptions. Um, even though we know that might be a better option, we say get to the LAN using a VPN, and that's the best way to access stuff. The trainers may need to provide feedback on courses to allow materials to be updated. The trainers um, may need to provide attendance information for billing purposes, follow up with delegates, may need to communicate with head office example via email if any issues or queries arise so again this second part was simply for types of materials that will be accessed or the information that they will need to access using the vpn the first part was what are the benefits maybe drawbacks of using the vpn to access the information and then for this part uh, the type of information or data that they will access now this answer these answers didn't mention anything about the negatives but typically when speaking about implications, if they have not specified that it needs to be the good or the bad, you typically do both. So for the negatives of a VPN, think about the fact that you always have to keep logging in. It might be of an inconvenience. It might be um, a bit, well, not a bit. It might be noticeably slower. If it doesn't work, then you don't have access to anything, just like the internet doesn't work. But we're going to stick to VPN. If the VPN just doesn't work so let's say the vpn servers are down i use um, secure vpn if those servers go down in america or in germany wherever i use them for i won't be able to use the vpn meaning i won't be able to get to the content i need to get to which means that i cannot do my training potentially if i have the outdated resources so just think of the negatives of a vpn i can't list everything here so whenever i mention something please 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 go ahead and google it as well if you Google negatives of VPN, you will have a massive list of things and you can pick from any one of those because they're all correct. Um, it's just that the answers that they have in this thing might be a bit older because I think this book was from 2014 or 2015, right? So please, please, please go over and Google stuff you're not sure about as well. Part two of the same question is saying, analyze the risks to data that arise from trainers using a pool of shared laptops and suggest measures that can be taken to reduce these risks. Now, again, a pool of shared laptops is simply laptops that people can go pick and choose from as and when they need it. So, again, you're in college or in school, you have a trolley filled with laptops or a room filled with computers, and you simply go log into whichever one's free at any time. We're going to look at the risks of people doing that. Potential threats to stored data. Viruses and other malware can corrupt or delete stored data, which would at least inconvenience the company but could potentially be very expensive to correct or re-enter or to fix the problem, right? So that's another issue using shared laptop. Different people would use different websites and different services that someone might plug in a memory stick that could give you some form of malware. Unauthorized access is one. Hackers can have major impact on the company by accessing information, example, financial information, and on trainers and delegates, example, personal information. So once somebody hacks that laptop, they could potentially have access to the LAN in the company in London. They could have access to other resources on the same network. Accidental damage is another one. So example, lost data can be very expensive to retrieve. Someone might accidentally delete something. Someone might move something and that might mess up other things for other people. Because you're using a network, 
and other people have to gain access to that same resource, that same image or Word document or PDF, if you move it or delete it, you might actually hamper someone else's work. Phishing has the potential to take and use personal information for illegal or improper purposes. So again, maybe everyone using a laptop might not be as clued up as they need to be. They might see a phishing thing or an, an attack and think, oh, this looks real. Let me click on this link and then it could lead to something else. So techniques for preventing unauthorized access to the laptops. Firewall installed on the laptops in addition to the network to prevent unauthorized access. So we should have a firewall on the laptop as well. Well, this malware, anti-malware software on the actual laptop as well. Even though the network might have a firewall, even though there's a VPN that does encryption, still have something on the laptop as another means of protection. Next, we have password protection on the laptop provides access to the trainers, uh, but prevents unauthorized access. If someone does not have a username and password for the actual laptop, they cannot log in. Makes it very simple. And all of the trainers would have those details. So the trainer could be the person that logs in all the laptops every morning when there's training that needs to take place and then hands it to someone, taking their name to know who used that laptop. Set up user areas on the laptops for individual trainers that are password protected because it's a pool of shared laptops different trainers could just come in and grab a laptop right so if you have a user area on the laptop that says person a person b person c only those people can log into those user areas at any one time access levels for trainers and file permissions for trainers. now these two can potentially be tied together access levels think about it like this you have access to your house your parents probably give you a key but your parents have more access to that house. They might have keys for every single room, every single door. They pay the mortgage, so they have more control over the house than you do. And then file permissions, again, more, more along the same lines. You give people read or write access or read and write access. Read access simply means that you can view the file. You can't make any changes. Write access means that you can typically write to the file or make changes to the file, right? So some people have read or write, some people have read and write. Um, and again, access levels, this is probably something you have or may, may not have come across already. You have different levels of access. Let's look at it in terms of a school, right? As a normal teacher, I have access to my work, to students' work. Below me is typically a student who, ha who only has access to their work. Now, going the, other, um, going the other way, the person who's above me, so my manager or even the IT person in a school, they can access almost everything they want. They can reset passwords. They can do whatever they want. So we will have different levels of access. The IT person would be at the very top. They might even be more clued up than the principal in most cases, and they can actually delete the principal's account in some cases. Below the IT person would be a normal IT teacher like myself, for example. And below me, there would, there, there would be students who can access their work. So access levels for trainers would be something similar. So you have the very, very top trainer, the manager trainer who can access every single thing. Then under that, you have maybe the intermediate trainer who, who can access most stuff. And under that person, you have maybe like someone who is actually training to be a trainer. They might have access to just a few things. Here are some techniques for preventing other threats to data stored on a laptop. So I mentioned anti-malware, antivirus software installed on the laptops as well. Physical methods. So laptops are portable, so they might have keep them in a locked room somewhere. Trainers should use external storage devices with caution. So they should not ideally be plugging in random memory sticks and random hard drives into the laptops. So those are probably the main ones that you can actually add.